Um, if you have any questions or you'd like more information or anything like that, uh, the best way to get a hold of me um, is through Teams Chat. I have the, the app on my phone and I get notifications and I get pinged on that. Um, the email I check once a day. I like gifts, by the way, so you're going to see gifts a lot. Well, not that much, but you're going to see gifts in here. So engagement. Why should we establish engagement um, with students? And it's kind of obvious, but I'm just going to go through some things. Number one, especially during the pandemic, it's easy for students and for us to feel alone uh, and feel disconnected from people. Um, students are often hit harder because they don't necessarily have the established network that we do from friends and colleagues. Um, many of our students are first gen. I was a first gen student like 100 years ago, and so I couldn't even turn to my parents say, you know, what is it like in college? And of course, we weren't living through a pandemic uh, then, but um, uh, so many of our students are first gen students, and so they don't have somebody at home to say, well, this is what you do in college and then going through that pa the pandemic, it can be very frightening and terrifying. So it's really essential to establish engagement with students. Um, I one of the, the sad things, too, is I've had students and I'm sure you have had too who uh, address you through email or if you have a, a, a virtual office hours where they start off with, I'm sorry to bother you, but. And um, that was kind of, you know, the norm before, but it seems to have picked up a lot last semester. Uh, and so the way I interpret that is they're feeling they're feeling alone. They're feeling kind of lost. And so I started trying all these different strategies and I've used, you know, a couple of them just sporadically but last semester, I really, really employed them. And so that's what I'm gonna, going to share with you. Three strategies, two of them where students can engage with each other and you, but you're kind of like the, uh, it's like on a third level. Um, but the third strategy, they will engage with you directly. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, besides helping them from, you know, not feeling alone, it helps them establish a community with the students, with their fellow classmates. Um, as I mentioned, I teach full time at the Northeast campus, so I'm used to the classroom setting. So students see each other, but um, uh, with online, whether we're uh, campus faculty moving all online or we're solely TCC Connect, we still need to establish that community. Or I firmly believe we can just I'm the daughter of a horseman and I ride horses too. So the, the old cliche of you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink kind of plays in here. You can give your students all these all these opportunities, but you can't force them to take a uh, uh, take a part of it, a part of the opportunities. But regardless, we want to establish and to help foster a community with the students and with ourselves. So um, we encourage that student connection to the topic itself, especially if you're dealing with abstract thoughts and abstract concepts. Um, we want to establish that connection uh, or help the students establish a connection to each other and then to us, of course. Um, I'm sure you've experienced that too, where students are struggling. You get the sense they're struggling, but they don't come to you and uh, you may be reaching out. Uh, they're not responding emails or anything like that. Um, and then at the last minute or after an assignment is due, they ask for help. Mm -hmm. So this, I don't have easy answers for that. I wish, you know, I could wave a wand and everything will, will work out. But uh, I think helping establish that community and to use the, the, the saying that has kind of become abused, but it's very relevant, creating a safe space for students to where um, they feel like they can talk to you. Um, and you know, I mean, not only are you their professor, sometimes you're also uh, their kind of like de facto counselor. You know, they have issues that a lot of a lot of us don't realize they're dealing with from job loss, from COVID-19 uh, uh, diagnoses um, or family members dying. I had last semester was brutal. I had quite a few students who were diagnosed and I had a couple of students who experienced uh, death related to COVID-19. So we have to establish that that safe space, even though that term has kind of been 
abused in the sense that it's been hijacked by people who try to mock it. But we want students to feel safe. I want to feel safe. So if we uh, make that connection to the topic intellectually, because this is a college uh, after all, you know, and they are in college classes and then to each other and then to us as instructors, these uh, strategies that I'm going to share with you also help students to well feel part of the community, but also to reflect, reflect <gasps> on what they're learning. What the hell's and wrong here? <laughs> I often feel that way too, ma'am. Um, to reflect on what they're learning, um, but also to reflect on themselves, but also to help them turn information into knowledge because that's where learning happens. When, we've, when, when we're given, when students are given that space to get all that information, all that data that they've been accumulating, and then start you know, taking a mental step back and thinking about it, reflecting it, and then that's when it becomes knowledge. So I'm sure you're familiar with the Bloom's taxonomy. The lowest level of critical thinking is remembering, memorization. That is not to knock memorization. We all need to cultivate strong memorization skills. However, that is the lowest form of critical thinking. The highest form of critical thinking is creating. Uh, creating paintings, creating music, creating compositions, creating formulas, creating new ideas of uh, new ways of looking at something. Um, and. We, we all stand on the shoulders of, of those who came before us, of giants, those who came before us. But we get so much and students get so much information that it becomes easy to get lost in that forest of information. And so the strategies that I'm gonna share with you help not only us, but help students also begin to see and identify and make connections between all these disparate ideas and concepts. And that's when they start creating their own knowledge. That's when they start creating, um, uh, well, knowledge. Um, and so that highest form of critical thinking is creating, making sense out of what seems to be nothing, but in reality, it's chaos, in my opinion, uh, making sense out of chaos and forming it into some kind of coherent and cogent form where students can uh, uh, take it in. And, and not just students, us too, you know, the, the adults, the professors. So the strategies that I'm going to show you help students to see connections, to make connections, and they're particularly uh, good with visuals. Um, I'm not a, a really good audio learner. I like visuals. So the strategies that I'm uh, employing are very visual. Okay. Um, one of the things, especially, you know, online discussions, uh, uh, having discussions is the, the way students start processing and making order of things. And um, those of those of you who know me, I'm not a fan of Blackboard. And one of the things about the discussion board is it's very linear. Uh, and because I'm visual, I like to see things. I'm the one that creates the concept mapping and you know, I make notes and I draw all these lines between all these different ideas. So the first one I'm going to show you is Padlet. Um, now, unfortunately, Padlet is not free. You are given three Padlets to try out. And so the first time I tried it out, I used three Padlets and I created, uh, I used them strategically. And I really liked them, so I ended up subscribing to it. So um, that that's the downside, Padlet is not free. But if you use those three Padlets strategically throughout the semester, you can augment discussion boards and other things, um, and you can create this visual connection. So Padlet is also a Windows app, and um, what you see on the screen right here is uh, what you see in Windows. So if you have a PC or you have a Windows operating system, you can download Padlet from the, from the, from the Microsoft, Microsoft Store, and um, this is what it looks like. So we've got these are some of the Padlets that I've created and uh, I get a kick out of you know the greetings every time you log in uh, it says you know have a magical day or you know hope you see a unicorn or anything like that so uh, those kind of make me giggle but you can also go to padlet.com and I'm going to show you uh, in a moment what that looks like so this is a specific Padlet again this is the Windows app uh, the way it looks and one of the things that I like about it 
is you and the students can automatically embed video. So this is a picture and these are videos and you, you don't have to have, you know, HTML coding or any kind of coding skills. You just simply find the link and insert it and it creates this image. You can see this image right here. So this Padlet. Let me click over here. You can see Frankenstein in the back. This Padlet, we began, uh, this is for my 1302. We were reading Mary Shelley, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's Frankenstein. And I wanted to introduce to them the concept of monsters, monsters in everyday uh, um, pop culture in life. So their first assignment was to create, uh, was to find, you know, talk about monsters, um, what they see in monsters in pop culture. And so uh, that just helped generate ideas. Now, one of the cool things about Padlet too, besides being able to include pictures or uh, visuals, uh, videos, is you can also physically create, um, physically show connections. So I'm gonna show you another Padlet. This was for my 1301, and this was the very beginning of the semester. Uh, I teach English, by the way, if I didn't say that earlier. Uh, what is critical reading to them? So I created a short video, not even a minute long, uh, showing how to post and then how to make connections. And you can see right here all these connections. So students, you know, when they post something, then they would read a cl their classmates post and then connect it. Um, and then in another assignment um, in Blackboard, we talked about this, where they saw those connections. So for those of those of us who are visual and who like to see those connections or who need to see those connections, this is a really great opportunity also because um, students, you can see the connections and then students have to make the connections. So they're making connections with the ideas themselves and with the classmates. Um, and frequently, you know, I mean, like in discussion boards where a student will post something and if you assign them and an, another student has to respond, um, that's really good too. But as I said earlier, it's very linear and uh, the responses are often nest nested within uh, the originating post. And it, it, it makes for easy grading perhaps, but it's, uh, or easier grading, I should say, but it's not necessarily visually attractive or visually in, uh, inviting where students can come in and just start exploring to see what their classmates are saying and what they're thinking about something. By the way, Padlet, you can export all the um, responses and you can export it as a PDF, which I've done. And then I, because I close these at a certain time and then I upload the PDF into Blackboard so students can still see each other. Um, they also had to do a, a digital portfolio and so they were able to grab or just do a screen grab or just post the entire Padlet into their digital portfolio. But it was as a PDF. So for grading, you can export it as a C, as a CSV or Excel sheet and then you just do a quick search when you're in the discussion, uh, the grading the gradebook and then you've got uh, I've got the, the Padlet open and then I just do a quick search by student name, read it and then I give them a grade. Um, so this just takes like another maybe extra one or two steps, but you can still grade quite easily with this uh, third party software. Um, so the other thing I wanted to show too is you can create like thematic Padlets um, this one, just critical readings, we have the shooting star. But uh, for those of you that have read uh, um, Jonathan Swift's Amata's Proposal, so I've got a little bit of a warped sense of humor. So I have, as a little image right here, a baby um, to uh, offset. And the, the numbers right there, are just the different classes, because I have multiple classes of the same prep. So it helps me visually keep track of what is, uh, which class this is. Um, when we're going through Macbeth, I've got, I've got the bloody knife there. And the background image are the three witches, uh, or the, the weird sisters. This particular assignment, I posted three different intros to Macbeth, and I had them um, talk about what they can expect from watching these three different intros, what they can expect from that particular production. So 
this and students again, they can read what their classmates have to say and it helps them get ideas and especially when they start composing their own essays uh, and you know as since I teach English again, as long as you know, you keep reminding them about, you know, attributing, giving credit to wherever you get ideas, they're not going to steal each other's works. I don't think students or people naturally want to plagiarize. I think a lot of it is they just don't know. And so I saw frequent, you know, students, uh, their, their narratives, their essays, where they commented, you know, as a, a classmate so and so said, blah, 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 blah. And then they expanded on that. And there is that connection between each other and with the ideas um, at hand. So another thing, and this is wonderful because it's totally free and it's really cool. Um, Flipgrid, this is the second strategy. And this is another thing that um, where students can engage with each other. Um, and if you come in, you, they can engage with you also. If you come in and put uh, um, comments on individual um, uh, Flipgrid posts or whatnot. But Flipgrid, it is owned by Microsoft. It is 100% free. There is no limit to how many Flipgrids you can create, uh, like there is with Padlet for the free version. You're limited to three. Flipgrid, as far as I know, it's, it's unlimited. And since it is Microsoft, you can easily integrate it into uh, Teams. Um, so you don't have to do all this fancy, you know, uh, um, uh, embedding in Blackboard. So again, with Frankenstein, this is my 1302. Uh, and this is a GIF and I'm going to take you to the, the website uh, in a moment, but it's also a phone app. Now I use a, an iPhone, so um, this is what it looks like with an with an app. Uh, and you can post, you can comment on it, on student comments. When you click right here, educator dashboard, it takes you to the website. And if you can see up here, there is the website and it is my uh, uh, administrative side, my administrative page of Flipgrid. However, what I really like about the Flipgrid, uh, even though it's not fully an app where you can automatically just uh, uh, enter and post and comment in the Flipgrid app itself, it takes you to the website. It is designed for mobile work. I mean, look at this. This is actually a uh, students. They were talking about uh, poetry. And this is a student's video that they created. One of the cool things about Flipgrid too is they've recently implemented mic only, which means for students who may be camera shy or for whatever reason they don't want to show their face, they can just create an audio and you'll see a microphone uh, and uh, they can also put pictures or images or things like that. And I'll show you an example of one of those in a moment. But and you can see my comment right here. So even though this takes you to the website, when you click on educator dashboard, it takes you to the website. It is still mobile friendly. I don't know if you ever tried to grade or uh, post something in Blackboard through uh, your phone or your iPad or tablet or anything like that. The, the design, the, the user interface is not particularly inviting and it, it can be kind of confusing. You have to scroll all the way to the right or you uh, the menu bar gets hidden and you have to click on that. It, Flipgrid doesn't do any of that stuff. So let's go back to this one and I will show you like the behind the scenes and there's that uh, Frankenstein uh, thing and I thought, it was kind of cool because here he's drinking something from the Frankenstein movie and the prompt is if students could sit down with and this was after they read the novel if they could sit down with Mary Shelley and talk to her and say you know like just talk to her about her novel what would they say what would they do uh, and so and I said you know over a cup of coffee um, so there's the drinking connection there is a join code you can share with students there and you can see responses here now this class has been archived, it's hidden. So when I show you the next screen, um, I like to embed assignments in Blackboard. So when they open up their uh, week's lesson, all the assignments are there from Padlet to uh, uh, Flipgrid, Flipgrid to anything like that. And so they don't have to leave uh, Blackboard to complete their assignment. Um, 
And if you use Flipgrid, you can see I've got some already set up for for spring, but what you can do is make it private or public. So I choose private because nobody needs to see my students comments. Um, if the students want to make their work public, they can, but not in our class Flipgrid and you can invite them or allow them to sign up through their student email. I'm not going to do the template or upload a CSV file, so I just put, you know, the at my.tccd.edu email right there. And so when they go to the assignment, the first time to enter their, their video or their audio, their podcast, uh, as long as they enter it through their my TCCD email, they're in. So that's how you can create it. Um, you can also, they can do username or Google Classroom, but we don't use Google Classroom. So that's some of the, the cool things about it. You can also personalize. Um, I found since this is for 1302, I've got a picture of Shakespeare there. And for my early American lit, I have a, 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 a woodcut from Mary Rowlandson's um, narrative. So you can, uh, um, personalize it as much as you can within its confines. So Flipgrid is really good for students to um, engage with each other, to engage with their text. Uh, oh, the other thing I was going to show you that I completely forgot, so let me go back to Flipgrid, is um, when I mentioned that students, they don't have to show their face. So here's a respond to a poem. See, there I am with the gifts again. I'm reading a poem. This, uh, well, this student, and it's actually the picture that I showed you in the previous slide where she just had her camera on the poem itself. But this student, I'm not going to play it, I'm just going to click on it. And so she created, or I don't know if she created or she grabbed it or what, but this is all we see, but we could hear her. Um, so again, if students are camera shy uh, or for whatever reason they don't want to be on the camera, there are alternatives where they can still do the assignment. Um, all they need is either their smartphone uh, with a camera or their laptop. And if they're taking an online class, they're going to have one or two uh, or at least access to it by borrowing it from uh, the college um, and then they can do this assignment. OK. So I said earlier that I was going to show you that I like to embed assignments, so I create I post the assignment. The instructions in Blackboard itself, so students get an idea here, and then when they enter the join code uh, here um, or their email address, they see the same instructions in Flipgrid itself. Now, because I archived that class, it's not visible, uh, and so that's why it says join code not found. But when the class is visible, or it's not archived, I should say, not visible because it's only visible to the class itself because I've made it private, um, they will see the assignment right here, just a miniature version of it. So you can just provide a link for the assignment or you can embed it in Blackboard. So I mentioned earlier, um, the third strategy is where students can engage with you and you can actually do this three to one strategy with uh, Padlet, Flipgrid, with discussion board, anything like that that works for you. Um, I use an app called Nearpod and uh, I'll show you that in a moment, but the three to one strategy and this happens after major lecture videos. I create uh, video lectures and um, especially if it's uh, over, you know, thorny topics or thorny issues. And what I mean by that is, you know, not necessarily controversial, but uh, like MLA, a lot of students have a hard time gathering, especially the difference between MLA 7 and MLA 8. Um, I have a hard time differentiating the two. That's why I have my trusty grammar book next to me in my MLA book. But um, it's the three to one strategy. It's three things learned. So I ask students to answer three things they learned from that lecture. And then the next question is two things they already knew, but the lecture confirmed for them. And then the final question I ask is what is one question you still have? So then what I do is I um, compile the, the, the data and I answer that one question they still have. 
So the three, two, one strategy, three things they learned, two things confirmed for them, and then the one question they still have. So I said earlier that I use Flipgrid, I'm sorry, Nearpod. Nearpod is a fantastic uh, resource too, and you can log in with Google or with uh, Office 365. I use Office 365. And so, this is what it looks like, uh, the behind the scenes. Now there is a paid version. I used it last semester and I'm gonna show you, I still have, I don't know if you can see it, it's kind of small for my 100 year old eyes. Um, I've used 7.3 megabytes of 100 megabytes. So I still have a lot of space with what I do, uh, the way I use it. You can use Nearpod for any other, uh, um, strategy i use it only for the three two one so i would i would imagine that if you use it to create actual lessons you're going to use up more space but when i when i see my space running out i'm going to start deleting these so you can create lessons combine content video and activities you can create videos through nearpod you can create a, a google slide presentation um, anything that you like what again what i do is just the um, three two one strategy so this one this can be we don't use zoom but you can actually do a live participation and you can provide i'm just going to click resume here here is the code that the students would need to log in. If uh, you can, you can email it to them. If you use Facebook or Twitter, or anything like that, uh, you can send it through social or you can link it. It blends, it integrates into Microsoft Teams. If you use Microsoft Teams for your classes or for uh, uh, like for live classes or for uh, study sessions or anything like that, you can just quickly embed it in Microsoft Teams and students can access it right then and there. So this is for a live session. And here are the questions. So you can see zero participation because this isn't live. So I'm gonna show, ah, I'm going to show a uh, student page. This is what I do. So after, uh, actually, I'll show you that in a moment. After they've watched the video, because I do video lectures, after they've watched the video, I then post uh, or I make it visible to where uh, students need to answer these questions. And again, this is optional for students. This is hey, was that? Yes. Sorry to interrupt you. We don't see what you're. All we see is teachers and students. Really? Yes. Ah, that stinks. OK. Let me see. Did you see any of the other websites that I uh, showed? I think it's whenever I think maybe the way you've shared your screen instead of just sharing the desktop, it's sharing whatever browser you're in. So if you click in something pops up we don't see that if that makes sense yes it does gosh i am so sorry okay let me let me try this again okay but we saw most everything so it's there's just a few little pop-ups that we missed yeah i see the red line gone away okay ah okay and I was trying all of this last night and it worked and even this morning and it worked. Yeah, when you go to share content, just share the whole desktop. I that's what I thought I did. So now let me try this again. I've got all these multiple things open uh, here and they're all different names so screencast one let me try this so some of you're going to see your faces pop up okay do y'all see it now we do yay okay i can continue this would you like me to go back and quickly show you the other things just so you can see visuals or uh just continue on i think continue if someone has a question at the end you can jump back Perfect, thank you. Okay, so sorry about that, folks. So uh, let's go. 
Live participation. So you can see it here. I'm just going to click start new session. And you can share social email, link it or embed it in teams. And this is what uh, the, the students will automatically get this code so they can um, enter in and they will. You can see that no participation because this is not a live session, but these are the three questions that I ask now. What I do is student paste because um, I don't hold live classes. I do the video recordings and so I create this and I'm going to show a preview for for uh, you and uh, you can see some related content on the side and you can borrow or use or tweak also tweak other students, other uh, faculty members, other teachers slides. But again, I just use it for the 321 strategy. So here's the first question. They answer. And then the next question they answer. And then the third question, what is the one question you still have that you would like me to address? And then they answer. So I said earlier that um, then you can, well, I think I said earlier, I thought it, you can compile all the data that the students get. And it sounds um, kind of spooky, but it's really not because Three, two, one. Oh, this is the way it looks embedded. Again, I said I like to embed assignments in Blackboard. Um, sometimes it will have uh, your your name, the professor's name there, but you just tell them just you know, erase it and put your own name. Since this is not a required assignment for students, I've told them you can do this anonymously. Also, you can just write anonymous there or Jane Doe or whatever you want, but nobody has done that, which is really interesting. And I'm sure there's a paper in there somewhere, but uh, students are putting their names to it. So. Uh, um, Nearpod creates these reports for you already, and this is just a screen grab. So I'm going to click on it and this is the actual PDF and it gives because again, students aren't putting anonymous. You see their names, so here are their answers and I read through them all to make sure they're on the right track, but the ones I really focus on are. What is one question you still have and would like me to talk about? And so I focus on this. I then classify them and answer them. Um, this is really good too, this Nearpod, because you can, um, number one, you get information from students, they're engaging with you, and then you engage right back with them by answering uh, their questions. Uh, the other thing too is these are really good uh, reports that you can use in any promotion folder or uh, uh, promotion and rank or tenure folder, anything like that. So. It sounds really cool to say, OK, I'm going to compile the data, but Nearpod does it for you already. And uh, depending on whatever questions you ask or whatever, uh, uh, whatever your lesson is, it will compile it for you. This is the only way I use Nearpod, the 321 strategy, and that's why I have a lot of space left too. It's like I mentioned earlier, the more if you put videos and things like that in there, you're going to eat up more space and you have up to 100 megabytes of free space uh, before you have to upgrade. So always keep that in mind too. So compiling the data and putting it together. Sometimes I create text uh, re re responses and then sometimes audio responses. So this is a text couple of uh, big questions, mainly really just two questions, if I remember correctly with this one, uh, dealing with MLA. So it was best served with a text because I was able to color code certain things to draw attention and I created, especially with questions about integrating ellipses in the middle of a quotation, I just did a uh, did a screenshot of, I have the digital MLA 8 uh, book, did a screenshot and then I annotated it and embedded it in Blackboard. So this is my response to the previous 321 strategy, the questions uh, that the students had. The other way that I respond is through audio and Audacity is an amazing and free open source software. Um, you can make it as fancy as you want. I just use it to record. I've got my headset on connected to my laptop and I just record my response to them. So I'm going to click here and take you to the website. 
It is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux operating systems. So it's pretty much all, it's pretty much available for any operating system that you have. Um, I've used it for both for Windows and Mac. Right now I'm using it on Windows. And you can see you can like this part right here, uh, you can edit out. Uh, I notice when I uh, talk, I do a lot of ums and uhs. So especially when it's kind of extemporaneous, I will edit those out. If you want to keep it real, you can keep it in, uh, whatever. You can also control for sound, like sometimes it gets too loud or, or um, I live near a, a kind of a busy road and so, you know, cars going by, I can muffle the sound or whatever. But Audacity is really good for, in my opinion, for quick things. It's actually good for anything, any kind of audio recording. I don't have skills for top notch audio recording using Audacity. So I use Audacity just to record those responses. So this is an example of an audio response. And this one, my 1301, English 1301, we, uh, they were doing archival research and they had to find an artifact that was at least one generation old. And they researched on that artifact, um, everything from the context, the history, the personal, the familial. So um, as an example, students, uh, the questions that they gave me in the 321 strategy, I used an example of war posters um, as an artifact. Now this right here is recorded through Audacity and I was able to upload it into Blackboard. Anytime I provide an audio recording, I always give them a transcript too. Now sometimes there's a little, there are a little bit of discrepancies because an audio recording, as I'm recording it, uh, even though I'm reading along the transcript, I think of something else and I quickly uh, say it. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, little quips or pop culture references. But if it's something major, then I just, since I have the transcript up, I just go in and change it. But I give them a transcript along with the audio recording. And these three buttons, students can download it. They can download the audio recording. So if they want to hear the lecture or the response, it's not really a lecture, it's a response to the questions they had, uh, they posed in the 321 strategy, they can download it and uh, listen to it, you know, if they're they, doing other chores or anything like that. In this particular response, again, I used uh, a couple of war posters as examples of artifacts. And uh, since this is just a screen grab, I can't scroll down, but I had another war poster on the bottom and we talked about it. So the 321 uh, one strategy is really good for students to engage with you. Uh, and then you can respond either through print, um, like the MLA, uh, example that I showed, or through audio using Audacity. So, any questions? I'm done, by the way. Okay, now I'm going to try to OK, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Because I don't know if the questions are in the chat. You're welcome, Natalie. Any questions? You're welcome, Mary and Susan. Nearpod is really cool. Again, it is free up to 100 megabytes of storage. So if you want to play around with all these lessons, and Google is a, a really cool source because you can just Google something. And there are some YouTube channels where uh, teachers, they're ma mainly elementary, uh, primary, and high school teachers, where they're showing all this really cool stuff uh, with Nearpod. Padlet, uh, it is kind of pricey. It's $88 a year. So, I mean, 
you think of about the amount that you use. Uh, I use it a lot. Um, so I thought, OK, well, I'll, I'll pay for that. Um, but I wish it were free. Uh, Flipgrid is free and it is awesome, but um, Padlet, I like it a lot more, but I have to pay for it. You're welcome, you're welcome. Thank you. And Allegra has posted the uh, agenda for today's um, Connect um, um, stuff, I'm sorry, uh, the Connect Campus um, professional development. And I think, yep, there's the attendance link. So in the chat section, make sure you go in and uh, sign up or sign in so you can get credit for professional development. Y'all are very welcome. Again, if you have any questions or uh, feedback or if you're trying something, reach me, reach out to me in Teams and I am happy to help you, happy to uh, walk uh, walk you through some things or uh, listen to your frustrations or anything like that. Um, yeah. You're welcome. You're welcome. So if there are no other questions, I guess I'm going to go ahead and Leave. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, you guys uh, have a little bit of a break before our next sessions, which start at 10. I want to echo everyone thanking Lizette for sharing these wonderful ideas with us. Um, and I'm glad that I didn't know anything about Nearpod, so I'm already um, like looking <laughs> it up and signing up for it. Um, but yeah, our next session's at 10, and I dropped the agenda in the chat. So once you've uh, signed the attendance sheet, go get some more coffee um play with your dogs <laughs> and then you can join <laughs> us for our 10 o'clock session thank you everyone thanks y'all bye